Buckle up, everyone. You are strapped in and ready for the Insurance Hour with me, your host, Carl Sussman, the resource to help you navigate the world of insurance. There is a lot of misunderstanding about what insurance is and what insurance isn't. Let me help you demystify insurance and have some fun while we're at it. Informing, educating, and entertaining Californians one policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. Hello, hello, everybody. How are you today? Yes, I, I'm. I'm sitting here listening to the intro rolling, and I'm clearly having too much fun because I'm. I'm pantomiming everything that that's being said. So it's definitely one of those days. And that reminds me, before I forget, um, I'm going to share something very important and, and a little bit personal with you at about the halfway point of the show. So be sure you're sticking around because I. Uh, it's significant, and I, I feel that I do want to share it with you. But first, again, welcome to the show. Uh, this is Insurance Hour, and I am your host, Carl Sussman. Remember, if you do have any questions, the best way is to reach out to me, which which is basically what our show is going to be today, because I was absolutely bombarded with emails with questions. Uh, as a reminder, you're going to send your request, your questions to questions at insurancehour.com. Or you can call directly at 559-656-0317. Either one of those will get you to me and we'll be able to uh, answer your question. But without further ado, uh, I've literally just on my screen copied and pasted a bunch of questions that uh, had come in. Some were a little sarcastic. I'm not going to lie. Some some are a little cringeworthy. I, I mean, I do this for a living, right? I understand if you've had a bad experience uh, I didn't do it, right? I am not the face of insurance. I am not the face of underwriting. I am not the face of claims, thank goodness, uh, of any of those things. I'm not the face of any of those things. I mean, I, I, I do what I can. And my goal, again, is to educate people so they understand how insurance works, what it's designed to do, what their expectations should be. And, and they'll be able to get the most out of it and not have that shock value, whether it be a claim not being paid or a price that's going up or a non-renewal coming out. Nothing happens in a vacuum, right? There's no such thing. Well, I should always quantify, right? It is extraordinarily rare that something will happen and a client will ask a question and I'll just have no explanation for it. They they're non-renewed for something. Well, why was why am I being non-renewed? I've been with the company for twenty years. Well, let's have a look. You put a claim in every year the last four years. Hmm, that might be a problem. It's a poss it's a possibility that the insurance company is tired of playing that game, right? I mean, these there's a reason behind things, right? It's it's math, and math doesn't lie. So, in the event you have a question, in the event something just does not make sense to you, ask the insurance company, ask your agent or broker, or da 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 da, ask me because that's what I'm here for, to answer those questions. So let me jump on to the first question, which uh, is basically asking where the best place is to buy car insurance. Uh, and, and you know, I actually did an entire show on how to, uh, on the different purchasing options you have for auto insurance or insurance in general. And it basically boils down to three. You can purchase directly from an insurance company. You can purchase through what's called a captive agent or you can purchase through an independent broker. And there's pros and cons to all of them. Uh, purchasing directly through the insurance company, you're connecting directly with the insurance company, that's, that's the pro. The con is that you don't really have selection or options, right? They're obviously going to tell you, um, theirs is the best, it's their product. They're, they're not going to tell you, well, here's a, here's a proposal and there might be better ones out there. That's going directly to the insurance company. Uh, going with a captive agent, this is an agent like, let's say, a state farm agent or an Allstate agent, perhaps, where they're but they're contractually bound to offer their insurance company's product or at least offer it first. And this option gives you the, the advantage of, in theory, expertise in the actual product, right? Since they're only offering one company uh, or two, maybe you would expect the that their knowledge of the product would be spot on, right? That they would just know it, know it, know it. The disadvantage, obviously, is that, again, they have the option of that one company uh, or maybe two companies. And so, again, you might get into that situation where it's trying to force a circle into the square peg, right? I mean, everyone needs to make a living, so they're going to represent the company's proposal and insurance in the best light they can. Then you have independent brokers, 
uh, and an independent broker will have access to, or should, if they're a good broker, uh, multiple insurance companies. And it might be a matter of 10 companies, 20 companies. Sometimes a broker will go to, believe it or not, another broker. Uh, those are called general agents who have access to even more companies. So it's entirely possible if you go to an independent broker that you're going to have access to literally dozens and dozens of companies, right? That's the obvious advantage. You're going to be able to have a policy that's specifically what you are looking for because you have so many choices. The disadvantage to that is, and it, it can be a disadvantage, is some brokers will charge broker fees, right? Which is an additional fee on top of the premium. And that's basically their fee for the work they're doing. By definition, an insurance agent represents the insurance company to the client and an insurance broker represents the client to the insurance companies. So that fee could be looked at as like you're retaining them, you're basically paying them. Keep in mind that this is this can be a fairly small fee for an auto policy, for an example, you might be looking at $50 a year, $100 a year, if it's a property policy. We're not talking about hundreds and hundreds of dollars usually, uh, certainly not thousands, but um, those are the advantages and the disadvantages, right? Uh, do what is best for you. In the marketplace currently in California, I strongly suggest you check every avenue because we are still in what's called a tight market, meaning that there are not a lot of options out there. Uh, over 87% of the market is either uh, not writing new policies, certain types of policies, or have heavy restrictions like waiting periods on exist on, on new policies. So whereas in the past, you might just pick up the phone or go online, request a quote, pick it and go. Uh, now you might have to have, wait two weeks before the company will actually allow you to start the policy. Or they might ask for documentation that they didn't used to ask for, like a utility bill, proof that you live at the location you live at, things like that. And again, these are things that are being done um, and they're not permanent, right? I'm happy to say that this is not going to be the way things are indefinitely. However, that is the way things are right now. So be prepared if you are shopping for car insurance, since we're back to the same question is how, what's the best way to do it is be patient and be prepared for it to really take some time because it's not the way it, it's been in the past where you can shop. I mean, I, I call it, you don't shop for auto insurance, you hunt, right? Shopping means you do that one or that one or that one or that one. Hunting is like, yeah, I got one. You're really in a position right now of hunting versus shopping, right? So be patient and check all the options that are out there, all right? I think I beat that one down. Uh, the next one that I had is asking how much does car insurance cost? And that's a really tough one because there are so many factors that go into it. It actually reminds me of an interesting point, And I want to make this. I have gotten asked probably more times than I care to remember, why is my insurance premium going up when my car is getting older and worth less? Hmm. That's a pretty legit question. And there's a pretty legit answer for it as well. If we were looking at strictly insuring the vehicle itself, there were no other coverage types. There was no liability, there was no med pay, there was no uninsured motorist. All these other factors were gone. If you were strictly insuring the vehicle, let's say you bought a policy and it literally is just a fire and theft policy on your vehicle, then there would be an expectation that as the vehicle gets older, the premium would go down and with all likelihood it would. The reason you are not seeing that in general happening is because of all of these other compounding factors that we've talked about in the past. And I'll just quickly touch on again, we have high inflation rates. We have the cost of labor that's gone way up. We have parts shortages. And we have just unbelievably expensive claims. We talked about this again previously, where whereas you know it used to be a couple hundred bucks if you get a fender bender, now that fender bender, because the bumper has cameras and sensors and because it takes a licensed and trained technician to be able to install it and all these things have to happen for it to all work properly, that claim is costing so much more money. So the insurance carriers in an attempt to try and stay balanced uh, have to raise the rates to offset those additional costs. So if you actually get into the nitty gritty, if you really are this, if you're this interested, look at your policy, look at the renewal, look at the last couple of years, if you keep them, things like that. And look at the portion because it usually is broken down of what you're paying for 
physical damage on the car that's listed as collision and comprehensive coverage and what that premium is and compare it over time. And believe it or not, you will actually see that that portion does typically go down. The collision sometimes may not, again, because it's costing more to do repair work, but the comprehensive part, right, the actual value of the vehicle, that cost can actually go down. So it's a matter of taking something very simple, like the car is older, the policy should be cheaper. If, that, if those were the only factors, that's spot on. But since there are so many other things that go into an auto insurance policy, that's not typically what you see because you have other factors that are pulling the rate up, all right? Not, not great, right? Again, we would like to be paying less, but as it turns out right now, again, we are in a really hard market and you should not be expecting rates to be going down at any point in the, in the very near future. And with that happy news, let's take a quick break and I'll be back with some answers to some more emails. Master the California insurance marketplace with Sussman Insurance Agency. Two generations of insight make us your ideal ally. Call 877-411-5200 or visit sussmaninsurance.com for information on your insurance policies now. Hello, hello. Here I am. That was fast. All right, back to the emails. And again, I thank you for sending these because it, it is, it, it's always more, uh, I feel like I'm accomplishing more when I'm answering your questions directly than when I'm just sort of sitting here and talking about what I think is important or trying to just explain insurance concepts in general. I think you get a lot more, um, I feel at least that I'm able to provide a lot more value when I actually can sit and answer direct questions. So thank you for these emails and I appreciate it. Again, if you want to send an email with a question, just send it to questions at insurancehour.com or you can call 559-656-0317. And uh, also in the email or the, or the message, uh, the voicemail, let me know if you want me to reach back out to you if you're looking for something specific, or if you just would like to have the question answered on the air. I respect everybody's privacy, so I'm not going to call anybody out and say, hey, you know, this guy called, can you believe he said this? What an idiot. No, not gonna happen. So if you do wanna have something specific answered and you want me to reach out to you, I'm happy to do that as well. Back to the emails. Okay, um, it's asking about auto insurance discounts. Um, auto insurance discounts are plentiful. There, there are a lot more out there than we actually know. And a lot of times we're getting them without even knowing it. And I'll give you an example. Um, there was a time, going back a little bit, uh, where uh, cars did not come with analog brakes, right? And if you're, if you're not familiar with exactly what that means, analog brakes are, it's that feeling if you ever stomp on the brakes and the brake almost vibrates back at you, it's almost like the car's fighting you. Um, that's something that was created to keep people from slamming on the brakes, which locks the tire in place and then you start skidding. What you really want is just to slow the tire down so you maintain control of the tire. So that's the general technology. And there was a time when that didn't exist. I can remember that time. And if you stopped on the brakes, uh, you're lo you would lock your tires and you'd start screeching and you'd make all those great lines and donuts in the ground or whatever. Not saying I would have ever done anything like that. I'm incriminating myself. I would never have done anything like that, but I'm just saying that that's how it used to work. Now, analog brakes obviously are a big contributor to not having an accident because if you're able to stop versus swerve and slam into something else, that's a good thing. So when analog brakes started to come out and become more available, the insurance industry responded. They were able to look at the numbers, their actuaries were able to you know, dig in, blah, 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 blah. And they said, wow, this is actually saving money. This is actually preventing accidents. And because of that, they started offering a discount for vehicles that have analog brakes. Now, since most vehicles these days have analog brakes, correct me if I'm wrong, if any of you listening know for sure, tell me. Uh, I'll, of course, go look it up after because now I'm curious and I'm the insurance nerd uh, after all. So uh, I think it might actually be a law that vehicles have to come with, with analog brakes. But my point is that they started offering a discount for that. Uh, that discount you may not have even been aware of that you were getting because the insurance industry knows by the vehicle ID number, right? The VIN number of your car, if that feature was available and if that car has it, 
and they would apply that discount when you're getting the quote. So there are some discounts that are actually happening, I say in the background, they're happening without you specifically knowing about it. You might also remember there were these automatic seatbelts for a while. Everyone remember that? It, it would come over your shoulder when you sit down and put it in drive and it would kind of slide down and it was kind of creepy. It was, it was actually really creepy. And the idea again was that this was to prevent people from going without seatbelts and that was going to save on injuries and that was going to cause premium um, claims to be um, lower in the amount that they were being paid out. And again, actuaries doing all their number crunching and they're like, hey, this works. So the insurance industry responded and they started offering a discount to vehicles that had automatic seatbelts. Did you know it? Probably not unless you stared at your policy and went line by line and looked at all of the discounts, but they did it and they're there. So. That's an example of two types of discounts that exist that you might not even be aware of that you're getting. So when you're purchasing a car, you're getting a new car, used car, whatever it is, keep in mind that there are features of the vehicle that will impact your insurance premium as far as discounts go. Some of them you can add, some of them you can't. Um, there used to be discounts that were um, for alarms on vehicles. Uh, some would be for, remember, LoJack? Um, not, not as big a thing as it used to be uh, for vehicle theft, right? Someone would steal your car and you could push a button or they could track where the vehicle was and then they could go and recover it. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, um, it fell out of favor a little bit. It certainly became less predominant because um, these cars were getting stolen and stripped of their parts so fast. That it was like in some horrible movie. By the time the police would get there, they'd find the low jack chip sitting on the ground and you know on the street so i don't know and i'm not trying to disparage low jack but i'm pretty sure it's not as prevalent as it used to be and sitting here right now i'm not aware of an insurance company specifically that does offer a discount for low jack there literally was a low jack discount that we would apply to auto policies because again the numbers supported it and if the numbers support it the insurance companies are going to embrace it right if if one company says hey we can offer a lower premium because we can see that less cars are stolen with this technology. They're going to do it because they're going to, number one, attract more business that's going to be less likely to have a claim. And number two, they're going to stand out from the competition. So there are discounts that are happening in the background, and you can usually go and look. Now, as far as other things that you can do discount-wise to lower your premium, there are discounts that you can proactively go after. One of them is called a defensive driving discount. And there are companies online that offer this. Um, they, they contact me all the time because they want me to refer to them. And I, and I don't do that because I'm not looking to become a referral service for defensive driving companies. But in general, what you'll do is you'll take an online course. I know, shocking, it's online. And you'll sit for eight hours and they'll talk about how to drive, basically. Uh, they call it defensive driving. I don't know that it's even defensive driving. It's really just how to drive properly. Um, you know, we take our driver's license when we're 16, give or take. And if you think about it, never again does anyone check to see how we're doing or if we're doing well. Uh, they just keep renewing the license and um, no judgment, just uh, it's not a bad idea to sort of have a refresher. I mean, there are certain things that you might not remember you should do, right? Certain habits you might have started that are not the best. So taking one of these defensive driving courses, a lot of insurance companies will offer a discount for that. So definitely look for that. There's another discount that I, I see very frequently, which is a good student discount. So depending, and again, this is carrier specific, some carriers will give a discount for drivers that, for, that are students that have a certain GPA. And this always amazes me because some companies will give that discount uh, if they're a B average student, some if they're an A average student, some we have to show they're on the honor roll. I don't know. Um, apparently, again, the numbers will show it. They're not coming up with this stuff. Believe me, no one at an insurance company is just randomly saying, hmm, I think we should do this. If they're offering a discount, especially in California, they have to substantiate it. They have to be able to show that it's real. They have to be able to show the Department of Insurance that this actually is something that is worthy and works that they can offer this discount. Um, so it is real. Why some carriers have different GPA averages, I don't know, but you can be on the lookout for that because that's definitely another discount that you can, uh, that you can look for. Okay, let's go to the next email. 
Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. Um, basically, this person had emailed and they were upset that um, there was there was um, work that needed to be done on their car that their car insurance didn't pay for. And what boiled down to was the work that needed to be done. Uh, I'm saving reading you the entire email. You're welcome. Uh, this was a maintenance issue. Okay. And auto insurance policies are not there to maintain the vehicle. They're not there to pay for new tires. They're not there to pay for oil changes. They're not there to pay for belts and tubes and all that other stuff. They don't. Uh, some vehicles, when you purchase them, uh, they will actually include, or if you lease vehicles, I think it's even more prevalent. They will offer you the ability to, to prepay for the maintenance on the car, or they'll include it as a perk, right? Oh, you don't have to pay for maintenance for the first 24 months, whatever it might be. And uh, that's because those are things that you would normally out of pocket. Those are not things that you would put in an insurance claim for. Maintenance is not insurance. That's actually a really good way just to keep that in mind in general. Insurance policies are not maintenance policies, right? Insurance policies pay for sudden and accidental death. Death. <laughs> Where did that come from? Sudden and accidental damage, okay? That's the mantra, sudden and accidental damage. That's the general, most over-encompassing way to look at what an insurance policy covers. And tires wearing down, does that happen suddenly? Well, if it's a blowout, maybe. Does it happen, do, do belts wear out under the hood slowly? Mm, uh, suddenly? No, not usually. So keep in mind, sudden, and accidental damage. And now I have to, I definitely need to take a break because I need a sip of water. And uh, when we come back next, I will be letting you know about um, this little bit of news that I wanted to share with you. Talk to you in a second. Sussman Insurance Agency, trusted for generations in navigating California's complex insurance market. For help with homeowners, fair plan, auto insurance, and more, call 877-411-5200 or visit sussmaninsurance.com. Your friend in the insurance industry. Hello, hello. Okay, um, we are back and I am uh, want to go through one more email and then I'm going to share what I wanted to share with you um, right after. Uh, the, the, ve the vehicle, the question was asking about gap coverage and they weren't asking for it by name, but they were explaining a situation where they purchased a vehicle, the vehicle was in an accident and the insurance company was, was paying them back less than the loan on the car. Uh, actually the lease, it was the leased vehicle. And they were saying, how is that possible? So you might not know this, but in general, if you drive a car, a brand new car off the lot, it has now lost about seven or 8% of its value. Just boom, like that. It's just the nature of the way vehicles work. It's always been like this. Vehicles depreciate, they don't appreciate, right? So it's entirely possible that when you purchase or lease a vehicle, you're already going to be in essence, having a loan that's larger than the value of the vehicle. It's just math. It just works out that way. I won't get into the why. It's just the way it's always been. So what happens is if the vehicle is totaled or stolen, the insurance company, most policies, unless there's a specific uh, endorsement to the contrary, is going to pay what the current value of the vehicle was at the time of the loss, right? Now, that has nothing to do with what you owe on it. Who knows what you owe on it? So you might end up with a gap, right, between how much you owe to the bank and how much the vehicle is worth. So there is coverage you can purchase to fill that gap. Anyone want to guess what it's called? Gap coverage, sometimes also called lease loan gap coverage or lease coverage or gap coverage, something along those lines. But you can definitely ask for it when you're getting a new car. Some manufacturers, uh, if you lease a vehicle, will actually include that coverage in part of your lease payment. So you don't actually have to pay for it separately from an insurance company, but definitely something to look for because that's one of those things that will happen and you weren't expecting it. And it's surprise, uh, you, you, you think you have insurance and you do, and the policy is paying what it's supposed to. It just happens that you have, you owe more on the vehicle than the vehicle was worth. Okay. So I wanted to share something with you now, very, um, I didn't say personal, but that I, I want to share it with you. Uh, I've been a, uh, a lifelong migraine sufferer and uh, things have been getting considerably worse over the last few months. And it turns out that the neurologist thinks that 
the the sheer amount of caffeine that I've been drinking has been causing my headaches. Now, I would drink three to four double espressos a day. Don't judge. The point is that I was always under the impression that it would help the headaches because headache migraine medication has uh, caffeine in it. Well, it turns out that if you have caffeine when you have a headache, it can help. However, if you have caffeine without a headache, it can cause a headache. So I have slowly been tapering down from the, all of those espressos to today. Today is a monumental day because today I had one shot of espresso and tomorrow I will have zero shots of espresso. This is not easy, by the way. For anyone that, that, that has ever stopped drinking coffee or stopped having caffeine, I can tell you, it is a challenge. It, it, you, you feel it in your bones. You feel it in your brain. You feel it. Um, caffeine is a pretty strong drug. It really is. So, so if I seem punchy in the next couple of uh, shows, you'll know why. It's probably because my brain is still adjusting to uh, not having that caffeine running through its system. But I did want to share that with you and let you know that if you are having headaches, um, not giving medical advice, um, maybe ask your doctor uh, or, or examine how much caffeine you're drinking, how much coffee are you drinking uh, that might be contributing to it. Incidentally, um, fun fact, did you know that the most recognized smell worldwide, right, across cultures and geography on the entire planet, the most recognized smell is the coffee bean? What do you think of that? All right. Let's take one more quick break, and then I'll be right back with you. California's insurance market can be challenging, but Sussman Insurance Agency knows the way. Trusted for two generations in home, auto, and personal insurance. Call 877-411-5200 or visit sussmaninsurance.com. Navigate with confidence. Hello, hello. All right, here I am now. Now that we've got that done, let me jump back in and let's go through some more emailed questions. Uh, somebody was asking, they are an Uber driver and they wanted to know if they needed to have special insurance for that. And this is a great question because the answer is a resounding yes, you do. You absolutely do need to have insurance, special insurance, if you are driving as an Uber driver. Now, Uber offers a, a, um, does offer insurance, however, this is how it works. It's, it's actually kind of interesting. You tell me in this scenario, when are you just driving like you would? And when are you driving as an Uber driver? You get in the car, you turn on the Uber app and you're driving along. La 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 la. Nobody in the car with you. La la la. Nobody in the car with you. You haven't gotten a notification that it's time to pick up a ride or you're just driving around. Are you an Uber driver at that point? Now you just got a message on your app and the app says, hey, uh, you've got a potential fare and go get that person. So now you've in essence been retained, right? You've accepted this rider and you're heading toward them now. Are you an Uber driver at this stage when you've accepted a ride and you're heading to that person? La, 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 la. Now the person gets in the car and you start driving that person. Are you an Uber driver at this stage? or not, la, 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 drive around. You drop the driver off and now you're in the car by yourself again, but you still have your app running. You're still looking for fares. Are you still an Uber driver? So you're driving around some more and then maybe you say, eh, I'm done for the day. You turn your app off, you're off, app off. Turn the app off. You see what happens without caffeine? The brain doesn't work right. So as you can see, it's not that simple to decide when you are driving and when the exposure you have is as an Uber driver and when it's not, or Lyft. I'm, I'm using these all synonymously when I just say Uber. I'm talking about rideshare in general. So what the insurance industry has said, and there's, as you can imagine, there's already been litigation. There's been all sorts of stuff as this has become more prominent where the carriers were saying, well, you were an Uber driver when that accident happened. That should go under, you know, Uber's responsibility. And the, of course, Uber's insurance company says, no way, there was no person in the car yet. And it's gone around and around through all those different stages that I discussed. So what that boils down to is the following. If you are engaged in any form of ride share, you must let your insurance carrier know so that they can do the proper endorsement, the proper change to your policy. Now, you don't have to tell them, 
you just may not have coverage then if there's an accident or a claim. So every time I say you must, keep in mind, of course you don't have to, just don't expect a claim to get paid in the event that you don't. So you need to tell your insurance carrier. Now, of course, the next question is, well, once you've done that, what's it going to cost? Some insurance carriers, if you tell them that you're doing rideshare, will tell you that they do not have coverage for you. They simply don't have the ability to add something onto the policy for that protection, in which case you need to find another insurance company. If you're with a carrier that does have the ability to offer that additional coverage for you, it's not expensive. Uh, we're not talking about hundreds and hundreds of dollars typically. Um, remember, things are a percentage of the general policy. So the more expensive your policy is, the more expensive potentially adding something like this might be. But in general, we're not talking about hundreds of dollars to be able to add this on. And fortunately, it has not gotten to the point where they ask, well, how many hours are you driving as an Uber driver? Because, you know, at that point, it's it's just going to get, it's going to get crazy. So keep in mind, again, that even though, yes, the rideshare company does have a policy, that does not protect you. You need to be sure that your insurance company is going to provide coverage for you. You don't want to be in a situation where maybe you've dropped off your, your last ride and you're kind of done and you're driving home and you have an accident. And then it's like, well, what were, where were you coming from? Oh, I had dropped someone off. Well, are you driving home from work now? Or is it just you're out for a drive? It, it becomes complicated. It's not worth it. Don't do it. Uh, just make sure you let the insurance carrier know and be sure you have the right coverage. All right. Uh, what else? Oh, this is a good one. Uh, someone went to Hawaii, very jealous, and they were looking to, um, of course, when you rent a car, they always want to so they always want to sell you the uh, the insurance, right? And what do most people say? They're like, "Well, I I have an insurance policy. I, I think I think I have coverage. Well, what do you think?" So, two things I want to go over with rental car coverage. First, rental car coverage, right? As a policy provision, you'll normally see it on your policy. It'll say twenty dollars a day, thirty dollars a day, forty dollars a day, something like that. That is not to be used for you when you go to rent a car. They're not going to, in essence, pay for you to rent a car when you're in on vacation. That particular coverage, we call it a line item. That particular line item is there to pay in the event you have a covered loss, right? Maybe a car accident. You have to rent a car while your car is being repaired. Then they will pay that stated amount for that stated period of time while the car is in for repair. It's not coverage for you to be able to just go rent a car, right? So that's point number one. Point number two, and this one gets a little bit into the weeds. I'm going to try and, and probably oversimplify it. Most, some insurance companies will extend coverage that you have on your vehicle to a car that you rent while you're using it temporarily. Some will do it only if it's a replacement vehicle for your main vehicle. Some won't do it at all. Some will extend just liability. Some will extend physical damage on the car. It, 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 whole, it just depends. So personally, what I do is I purchase the insurance from the rental car company because I want to know that at the end of the day, if there's an accident, let's face it, when you're out of town, you're driving around, you're in unfamiliar areas, likely you know something could happen, right? So just suck it up, make that part of the expense. It's usually not... Uh, you just pretend that's the amount that it would have cost you to rent the car anyway. Just get the insurance because it's really a matter of unless you're going to be a policy expert or a coverage expert and sit down and read the fine print and see, is coverage going to extend? And if so, is it liability? Is it the full limit that I have? Is there a drop down limit? Is there physical damage? There's so much involved that don't assume that you just have the coverage. It just makes more sense to purchase the rental car coverage. OK, and another thing that I hear, and this wasn't in the email, is people say, oh, well, I use my gold card, so I have coverage from that. Maybe. Have you looked at the actual insurance provision for your gold card? Well, usually, at least the last time I saw one, granted it was a long time ago, uh, it was what's called sitting in the secondary place, meaning it would pay only if another policy, it would pay only after a policy before it would pay first. So for example, 
if your in personal insurance company had a policy that would pay, it would pay secondary. If the rental car company you would purchase from, then it would pay secondary. So again, I don't want to get into the weeds. Just take it at face value. If you are renting a car, take the insurance. It sucks. What can I tell you? Maybe someday we'll be at a place where we can literally have an endorsement that we can specifically add to our policy that says, hey, in the event you rent a car, you will have the same coverage you have on all of your cars. That'd be great. It doesn't exist that I'm aware of right now. So for the time being, um, better safe than sorry when it comes to, to uh, rent a cars. All right. Uh, let's see. Oh, um, somebody asked if uh, they said they're they're coming here from another country and they don't have a uh, a driver's license. How do they get insurance? This is a great question. Now, if you're coming from somewhere in the continental United States and some of its territories, I can't tell you for sure which ones are reciprocal, then that driver's license will be accepted in California, at least for a period of time. If you're taking up permanent residency, there are limitations and you may have to exchange that for a California license at some point. However, if you're coming here with an international license or a license from somewhere else, you have to you have to assume that as far as California is concerned, you basically don't have a driver's license. Now, some insurance companies will accept the international driver's license. Some very few. Uh, if you've ever tried to get an international license, I actually uh, have uh, per, did, did go ahead and get one when I was planning a trip. It was actually right before the pandemic and the trip got canceled, but I ended up having the international license anyway. Um, it's not hard to get. Uh, it's not like you take a test. So carriers don't look at the international license and say, oh, cool, he's taking a test, he's driven, he's or she's good to go. Uh, they're going to look at you, in essence, more along the lines of somebody without a driver's license. Now, there are insurance companies that will that specialize in coverage for people that have international licenses. And when I say international license, I'm not just talking specifically about that specific international driver's license, but a license from another uh, country in general. Um, one other caveat to be aware of is that Canada does uh, you can you can use your Canadian license in California and vice versa for, again, a short period of time. Coverage is typically extended into certain provinces in Canada. Uh, but again, check your policy to find out exactly what that is. And again, these are on temporary, this is all on temporary basis. If you are moving to a state, you will need to, depending on which state it is, obtain a, pol a policy, a license from that state. It's just a matter of when. Some states might be 30 days, some might be 60 days, some might be 90, it just depends. But don't think that you can keep your Texas license because it looks cool and you are younger and uh, you wanna keep that license. Uh, you are going to have to switch that to a California license in the event you're taking up permanent residence in California. All right, sorry, can I tell you? All right, one more and then we will take another quick break. Um, this person was complaining about the cost of insurance and thinking about going without insurance, asking, is that legal? And uh, it's an interesting question because in the state of California, you, you have one of two choices. You have to either carry liability insurance or you have to post a bond. Now, what does that mean, post a bond? Well, it means that you take, you, you go to a bond company and you sign a contract with them where they promise to pay X number of dollars in the event that you have a loss. Now, doing this has certain problems. Number one, there's no claims adjuster involved. There's no advocate for you. There's no one to deal with the legalities of it, right? I mean, if you have a car accident, the first thing you do is reach for your license and say, oh, let me call the insurance company, get my insurance card and let them deal with it. If you post a bond, you're just sort of on your own, right? You may be able to start writing checks, but no one's going to help you with it. That's the first main problem. The second problem, which is probably as big a problem, is the bonds are small. We could be talking about a $10,000 policy. So technically, you cannot carry auto insurance in California and still drive legally if you have the appropriate bond. However, it is extremely limited coverage. The amount of uh, the limit of liability is extremely low and you don't want to do it, all right? You, you, you just don't. It, it is legal as long as you get the right limits and make the proper filings, but th this is not something that you want to do. It's just not, okay? 
All right. Let's take another quick break. I will have not an espresso, just a little bit of water, and I'll be right back. In a tough California insurance market, you need expert guidance. Trust Sussman Insurance Agency with a legacy of understanding complex coverage needs. Call 877-411-5200 or visit sussmaninsurance.com. Treating clients like family for two generations. Hello, hello, and I'm back. Yes, I am definitely missing my espresso. Water just does not do it. Incidentally, did you know that drinking caffeine is a diuretic? It actually, it, 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 it's, it has the opposite effect. It makes your body lose water. So when you first stop drinking caffeine, you need to drink extra water to try and get yourself rehydrated again. It's, it's, it's kind of, uh, I don't know, man. Can you tell this is really working on me? Uh, before anything, I want to remind you that, again, you are listening to Insurance Hour on KMET, and this, of course, is 1490 AM, so make sure you keep it there and keep it with us all the time. We've got some awesome programming here. So back to the email questions that we have. Um, there was a question of, that somebody had about working and their insurance while they work, and this is an interesting area as well, because where do you draw the line between I use my personal car and I drive to the office, if anybody does that anymore, and back versus I drive to clients, right? Versus I drive to a job site and another job site. There are all these different nuances that come into play. Now, these are generally ways to look at this. You would get personal insurance, right? Through a private insurance company, provided that you do the following. You either don't drive the vehicle having to do with work at all, in which case we call that pleasure use, because it's just so much pleasure to drive. Uh, if you drive up and back to work, the insurance carrier is going to ask how far is the office or wherever you're going to work every day. They'll do some math and, and you'll be OK. Or there's what's called limited business use. And that might be you drive your car to the office and maybe once you go out to a client. It's not your usual thing. but yeah, you, you go out to a client's house sometime and 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 that's it. Maybe two clients on, an, on a given uh, day, maybe, but that's definitely not the norm. Now, I'm speaking generally. Again, remember, insurance policies are all a little bit different. So don't take this as gospel that this is for sure it is. If I go to one place, I'm okay. Carl said so. No, it doesn't work that way. This is the general way of looking at it. Now, if you are in a position where your vehicle is being used strictly for business. Now, how do you know that it's being used strictly for business? Well, the first thing would be it's registered to a business. If the vehicle registration is registered to an LLC, to a corporation, it's a pretty good guess that you're going to need to have a commercial auto or a business auto policy, not a personal auto policy. Another way that you can look at to try and decide in your own mind whether you're going to be looking at a personal auto or a business auto policy is, where do you park the car? Does the car get parked at your house or does the car get parked at the job site or at the office building? Where, where's the vehicle? Okay. Now, when in doubt, because this makes a big difference, you need to ask a trusted advisor, ask an agent, ask a broker, ask someone, tell them what you're using the vehicle for. Let them help you decide whether you need to get a personal auto policy or a commercial auto policy. They're going to cover similar things, they have slightly different names and slightly different ways that the policies are written, but it's important you have the right coverage, right? Don't just assume. If there's one thing that I can tell you that gets people into trouble, kind of like I mentioned earlier with having the, the gold card and just saying, hey, I've got coverage now if I rent a car. Don't assume anything, okay? Go to a licensed professional and ask. Heck, that's what, that's what they get paid for. They get paid to offer coverage that's appropriate for you, right? That's what they do. So don't assume anything. It's going to get you into trouble. Ask and be sure you have the right coverage. So you'll know whether you're going to be getting a personal auto policy or a commercial or business auto policy. All right. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's find another one that was here. Um, oh, this is an interesting one. What is an SR-22? All right, an SR-22. Now, you may have heard it before, uh, but not known what exactly it means. Uh, and it's not, it's not scary. Um, it's basically a document, or these days, it's a filing that's done electronically 
that an insurance company will send proof to the Department of Motor Vehicle that says, hey, this person has insurance. That's it. Nothing fancier than that. Nothing to see here. Now, why do some people have to have an SR-22 and some don't? Any guess? Well, if you've been in an accident or you've been pulled over and you were uninsured, uh, part of your punishment for that, other than fines and potentially jail, it's bad, uh, is you might have to maintain what's called an SR-2 filing, which means that the Department of Insurance is going, not the Department of Insurance, the insurance company is going to continually have to send proof to the Department of Motor Vehicles saying, yes, they're still insured. Yes, they're still insured. If you drop that policy, guess what the insurance company is going to do? They're going to send notification to the Department of Motor Vehicles. This dude's not insured anymore. All right. So when you hear an SR-22 and you start wondering, what does that mean? Is that bad? It's not bad. It's probably bad that you ended up having to have it. But once you have to have them, it's not a dangerous thing. It's not an expensive thing. Carriers don't usually charge for that. And um, even some agents, I believe, or brokers have the ability to do an electronic filing for you. So you, you might not have to even deal directly with the insurance company. Some brokers have the ability to file those documents, um, that proof electronically to the Department of Motor Vehicle. Another question on here is about motorcycle insurance. Wow, I don't see a lot about that. Um, that sounded bad. I don't know. I just don't see a lot of motorcycle uh, insurance policies. There are probably a lot of brokers that specialize in that, right? And so that's sort of their niche. And so they they do write a lot of that type of policy. Now, why? what does that mean? Well, remember we talked about personal insurance versus business insurance? Well, a motorcycle would not fall under a personal auto policy or a business auto policy. Well, it could be under a business auto policy. But in general, a motorcycle is going to be under a, anybody? Motorcycle policy. I know. It's shocking. It's shocking. Every once in a while, things are just a little too simple. But you know if you have a motorcycle, right? If you have a motorcycle, don't assume, again, that you're going to have coverage for your motorcycle on your personal auto policy, because chances are you will not. You may need to get a motorcycle policy. And I'm starting to sound like a broken record. What do you think is the best way to find out what type of a policy you need to have? Ask someone that's licensed and trained who knows to tell you. Don't assume, don't guess, don't figure. Go ask someone. It, questions are free. Right. What was that old? Uh, what did the principal used to have on their, their desk? Something like, you know, questions are free, answers are dollar or something like that. Uh, you know, a good agent or broker will, will answer these questions for you. Uh, they're not going to charge you, but they're going to help, you know, guide you in the right direction so that you have the coverage that you need to have it, because it's important. Uh, again, motorcycles are not covered under auto, personal automobile insurance policies 99% of the time. There are, again, Always exceptions. The next question as, is about health insurance. Wow, we're finally off of auto insurance for now. Whew. That's a, that's a relief. Uh, I was starting to sweat thinking about auto insurance now. The question is, <laughs> well, they're, they're upset at their health insurance premium and what it's paying. Uh, health insurance is a really, really, really tough one. And let me explain why. Uh, a little history lesson will help. In the past, Right. When the concept for health insurance started to be developed, the idea was if something really bad happened to you, if you were in a really bad car accident, if you came down with a really with a terminal illness or some form of cancer, something major happened, then you would have a policy that would help you get treatment, would help you get well. That's what it was for. Some policies would literally only pay if you're in the hospital right? Then another insurance company would come in and say, hey, you know what? We can do better than that. We'll pay, not if you're just in the hospital, but if you go to the doctor, if you're in an accident or if you're hurt, blah, 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 blah. And then another carrier came in and said, hmm, we can do better than that. And they keep adding on different coverages, right? And we, we've gotten to a place now where it, health insurance is not really acting in the way that it was originally designed for. It really does need a, re, a redesign at this point. Because not only do we want to have health insurance where we can go to whatever doctor we want, whenever we want, we don't even really want to pay. We want to pay a copay. 
which mind you is really just, you're not paying for it. You're paying for a piece of it. So health insurance has come a long way. It's come from ca catastrophic damage only to where we are now. And again, not making a judgment call. I think everyone needs to have health insurance, but we have to also understand that in the current environment that we're in, the current system, the way it's put together, just doesn't do a really good job of pricing and, and putting out product. If we go back 10 years, 15 years, there were many more insurance companies that were offering coverage for health insurance than there are today. And that's because they were not able to keep up. They were not able to stay profitable. Remember, I've said this a million times, insurance companies are not charities. They are not nonprofits. If they can't make a profit, then they're not able to continue doing business. They won't have money to pay claims either. So keep in mind that health insurance right now, the reason it's so expensive and the reason it's so complicated is because it's in it's functioning in a way that it was originally not designed to do. At some point, there will be a change. There'll be a fundamental change in the way the policies are written, in the way they're priced, in the way they're purchased, in the way claims are paid, and we'll be in a better place. But for right now, it is it is difficult. And I can't I can't tell you that you're going to be able to go to this company and have a great health insurance policy. You probably won't. Um, I personally don't sell health insurance because I'm not comfortable enough with the product itself, believe it or not. So I don't like offering things that I can't really get behind. And since I don't know of a carrier that I'm really thrilled with in general, based on price and based on what they provide, we simply don't offer it. All right. So health insurance, again, I just give you a deep sigh, you know, serenity now, um, you know, you can shop around a little bit. Group plans tend to be better. So if your employer has a plan, it's going to usually be better than the plan that you can get on your own. That's a little bit of uh, general guidance. Um, but again, for the time being, maybe just lower your expectations based on what you're paying versus what you're getting and stick with it because man, the bureaucracy there is massive. Looks like we're getting uh, ready to finish up for the day. Um, I, I really wanna thank everybody again for, for being here. Again, if you do have questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I love answering questions and I wanna do everything I can to, to help educate everybody. And I thank you all for taking the time to be here with me today and for listening. Stay put, stay on the channel, more good stuff coming. And I will happily be here to talk with you again next week. Take care. I do want to thank all of you for taking the time to listen today. I know insurance is not necessarily the most sexy concept. It's not the most exciting thing in the world. It is important that you understand what it is you're getting, what you should be looking for, red flags, you name it. You just need to know more than you used to. Things are more complicated than they used to be. If you have any questions, please reach out to me directly. You can email your questions to questions at insurancehour.com or call and leave a voicemail at 559-656-0317. Educating and entertaining Californians, one insurance policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. This show is dedicated to Shamrock Papa.